All right, Jesus is eager to finish his mission of bringing peace and safety and freedom to all humans on the planet. Jesus said this in Luke 4, 18, The Spirit is upon me, and he has sent me to proclaim liberty. And we have the Statue of Liberty in this country, but not in any other country. To liberty to the captives and recovery of sight, which is freedom to see. All right? Because if you're blind, you're, you're a captive. Uh, and liberty to those who are oppressed. Jesus is the freedom bringer. Isaiah 65, 14. My servants shall sing for joy of heart. The former troubles are forgotten and they were hidden from my eyes. And behold, I create new heavens and new earth. What is that? That is freedom from today's pollution. And this is a little strange, but the fires in Canada are down here. The smoke is... It's like, what's going on? I mean, they look a long way away, you know. But, but, you know, we have a polluted world and God's got to fix that for us. Jesus is giving us a spiritual snapshot of his future glory project in Isaiah 65, 18. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Jesus can't wait for these glorious freedom days to start. Jesus wants rejoicing now, knowing that this will surely happen after the end times. Now, it's like we're supposed to rejoice now? Uh, really? Verse 19, um, he says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people and the voice of weeping and no longer be heard and the voice of crying. Well, compared, compared to th that time, to this time, it's going to be a whole new heavens and earth. God is about to make city streets totally safe for children to play in. And you can all, I, I'm sure you can, think back and remember times when you've seen children playing carefree out in the streets. And, that, and you hear a car coming. It's like everybody's alert. Oh, oh, quick, get off the road. Right? But they're, but they're still safe. The car would never get close to the children. Nowadays, it's like you can't trust kids out of your sight for a couple of seconds. Um, verse 12 of Isaiah 58. You should be glad, you should be called the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Well, that's a good name. Isn't that a good, that's a title. Restorer of streets to dwell in. Zechariah 8, 3. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. That's a good title, too. I hope, hope they put that up in big print. The streets, this is Zechariah 8, 5. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Right? Is that, that's, that's a good ultimate freedom sign, right? When you don't, you don't have to have armed guards protecting your children. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land in the east and from the land in the west. There's going to be a second great exodus event. Most of us have read the first great exodus, leaving Egypt, killing Pharaoh and his army, um, 40 years in the wilderness and so on. There's going to be another great exodus, bigger this time. Zechariah 8.8, 8, I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God. God is bringing a giant world freedom day and it's like I've, I've been thinking about this for a while now in in australia um I'm, i've never seen stamps with a f american flag and the word freedom and and I, i'm not a stamp collector but i'd be surprised anywhere in the world any nation has the word freedom with their national flag on their stamps. Uh, there's, there's something going on in America that is very unusual to other countries because I came from Australia, I talked to my brother in Australia and uh, the government will allow him to do this, this and this but not allow him to do that, that and that. And, and you know, um, freedoms are getting a little short now these days but, but comparing everything, we're still very, very free, you know. And I, and I thought coming across the border from Texas to 
Arkansas. I said, what would it be like if there was a police check saying, like, pull me over, okay, who are you? Where are you going? And what's your name? Let, we're gonna search your vehicle. It's like, none of that. You know, we have been free, free for so long. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But God is bringing a giant world freedom day, Leviticus 25, 9, and you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound in the day of atonement, and you shall make the trumpet sound, verse 10, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty, right? And, and it's like, I don't know how the Statue of Liberty came about, but this is frequently talked about, it's visited, it's shown on, on film, right? Liberty, liberty, liberty. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that the young people understand much about that anymore because they're not getting taught a lot of history. But, but you know, the patriots, the, the old heads, they know it's been a tough fight to get to here. And it's looking like they're going to be a tough fight <laughs> in the next year or two, too. Leviticus 25.10, you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty. Each of you shall return to his possession. Each of you shall return to his family. So, hands up if you know where... Oh, okay. I, I thought there would be children here today. All right, we'll skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> we we're going to have a test with the children, but there are no children here. Okay. God is, God is so smart, he made the fourth and the Statue of Liberty a part of his secret religious symbols. And most, most of you can't see that, but I've been pondering it for quite a while. And <clears throat> when God instituted his nation of Israel, he said, I am God. And here's my Ten Commandments. And they said, yes, sir, we'll do it. Right. And, and <clears throat> but when he, when he created the United States of America, he said, how am I going to keep these people focused? Right without religion, because if I give them a whole bunch of religion, they're going to turn their back on and walk away, right? So, so he gave them the flag, right? And, you know, when I first got to this country, I was amazed that when they play the national anthem and, and raise the flag, I mean, you know, there's silence, and people put their hands over their heart and they look at the flag. <clears throat> Statue of Liberty, you know, for the word freedom, it's like just when, when you say freedom, it, it triggers thoughts of how America got here. So how many of you will be at work next Tuesday on the 4th of July? Oh, I'm sad for you, but there you go. Some people got to do it. But in most cases, yeah. right, the, you know, except for shops, I guess, uh, <clears throat> but, but a lot of stuff shuts down on the 4th because it's almost... A religious holiday, yeah, almost, right? And and I used to think, well, why don't they just move the Fourth of July if it's on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday? Why don't they move it to the weekend? Then I discovered that it's on Tuesday this year. And they're having a four-day weekend. <laughs> so okay, that makes sense too, right? It's one of the most powerful days every year on the American calendar. The Fourth is Freedom Day and it's Liberty Day, and it's a reminder of the home of the brave and the land of the free. And what other country comes even close to that sort of talk <clears throat> about their country? It's like, well, we're just a country, right? <laughs> it's like, there's a certain pride that goes with the home of the brave and the land of the free. And, you know, world wars have been won, and, set in the war and lots of nations have been saved by the United States of America. So freedom is such a giant part of God's plan that he's planned a freedom year every 50 years. And we, none of us have ever experienced anything like this, right? But Leviticus 25, 11, that 50th year shall be a jubilee to you and you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord nor gather the grapes that you, of the of your untended vine. So for farmers, it's like, you get the whole year off. <laughs> so then the next question is, what are we going to eat, right? And he said, well, you can, you know, you can eat what grows of its own accord, just walk out in the field and get it, right? Tomatoes, there's a tomato, get it and eat it. But you don't have to harvest, the you know, you can take it, 
right? And and your vine, if it's it's unattended, but there's still grapes on the vine, go eat some grapes. So uh, verse 12, for it is a jubilee year, it shall be holy to you, and you shall eat the produce from the field. So you can still eat, right? And most, <laughs> most people are going to, how are we going to eat for a whole year without, you know, doing the farm work, right? It's a holy, free from work time for one whole year. And, and uh, <clears throat> it's like, I don't see how, you know, if you had a government sitting around having a committee meeting and saying, let's give the people a whole year off. <laughs> well, what are they going to eat? How's this going to work? What taxes will we get? You know, verse 13. It is the year of Jubilee, and each of you shall return to his possession. This Freedom Holy Year will begin on the Day of Atonement, which, you know, <clears throat> Atonement, Day of Atonement has multiple, multiple strings that attach to it. And, and to me, this is one of the more exciting ones. Verse 9, the trumpet of the Jubilee shall sound on the Day of Atonement. You shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty. So they're going to blow trumpets on atonement, Right? I don't know of any churches or a Jew, Jewish messianic or anybody that blows a trumpet on the Day of Atonement. They probably don't have the strength. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> And proclaim liberty. The Fourth of July quietly proclaims liberty for patriots. And, <clears throat> and you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure the term patriots gets used for people in other countries, but I don't think it gets used in the same way in this, as it is in this country, right? Pa I hear patriots referred to, in fact, there's a patriot supply company selling food, um, you know, and, and <clears throat> you hear the term patriot, 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 which ties back into the flag, it ties back into the word freedom, it ties back into the 4th of July, ties back into the home of the brave and the land of the free, right? So patriotism, in my opinion, is God's glue for holding America together. Right, it's, it's two hundred and it's almost two hundred and fifty years coming up in in a couple of more years, right? Um, and many times people in Washington have messed with the system, but but you know in twenty sixteen a whole bunch of patriots you know blew Washington apart and and put a non a non politician person in the White House, and nothing has been the same since, right? Um, <clears throat> but patriotism poured forth on December the 8th, 1941, after Pearl Harbor. And <clears throat> I was going to say I wasn't there. Oh, I wasn't there. That's right. I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> my brother was there, but I wasn't there. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, Pearl Harbor stuck it to a lot of good-hearted patriot Americans and they just signed up and went to war and they said, you know, they can't do this to us, we're going to go fix this. Patriotism was the sleeping giant that arose to crush Hitler and Japan. And, and it's cute that in the movie, um, the Japanese admiral said, you know, is quoted as saying, I fear we have awoken the sleeping giant. <laughs> well, in my, I, I'm 100% convinced that the sleeping giant is going to awake again, right? And, and patriots are being kind of pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And I think there's going to be a, a backlash um, to turn things around to fit with prophecy the way God's written it. Patriotism poured forth on September the 12th, 2001, after the Twin Towers came down, <clears throat> and three weeks later, bombs were falling in Afghanistan. And it's like <clears throat> in, uh, in World War II, the, the president said, how are we going to bomb Tokyo? Right, shortly after Pearl Harbor. And they said, um, sir, that's impossible. It's, we can't fly planes from here to there and back. And so they came up with a way of <clears throat> flying planes off aircraft carriers with bombs. And just enough fuel to drop the bombs over Tokyo and then fly over to Japan and crash was the plan. So, um, but what is that? That's, you, that's pride, that's, that's patriotism, that's, that's it's, it's a spiritual thing you can't really define very well, 
Um, if you say it's religious, not, be, oh, no, 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 nothing to do with religion, right? But God put the whole thing together, and he's still got a plan to use that patriotism and that sleeping giant again in the future. Um, he plans to capture Egypt and many Arab nations while saving Israel from destruction. Israel is his vocal nation, and he, you know, he wants it to be the way he's written it, and he doesn't want anybody to mess with the way he's written it, so he's going to save them from the Arabs, and later they'll be destroyed by the beast power, but that's the way he wrote it. So you can't allow the Arabs to destroy it. Daniel 11:41. He shall enter the glorious land Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. Right? Many countries shall be overthrown. Just a couple of words, but what is that? That's a war, that's a giant World War Three. You know, how do you overthrow many countries? And uh, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, and it shall have power over the precious things of Egypt. Well, that hasn't been the approach in the past. It's always, you know, teach them how to vote with their thumb or, or you know, nation building. Um, this, this is going to be a whole different way of going to yeah. war and a different way of dealing with a problem, but it's going to be much worse than Pearl Harbor. And the border's been open now for two years like and now they're saying that that they've found some elite Chinese people that they feel like are over here to do sabotage right and it's like yeah <laughs> they hate us they're at war with us we don't recognize it but you know um, the, the border's wide open so anyhow Jesus appears in the sky he will be bringing peace and freedom to the nations, but first he must defeat his enemies. So trumpets is an exciting day for the church, church members, because we'll already be resurrected, or that, that's the day of our resurrection, right? Arise to meet Christ in the air and get our spirit being bodies, right? Anybody here eager for a spirit being body? Like, yeah, me too. Whew, can't take, can't wait to take it for a spin. Ooh, it's gonna be great. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Revelation 6.14, the sky scrolled back as a scroll when it's rolled up, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Wow. You know, and they used to say, if you see the face of God, you die. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much of the face they see but when the sky opens up, they're going to be looking up and seeing a throne and a being sitting on the throne with a face and they're scared witless, right? Spitless, sorry. Uh, right? <laughs> but hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So, so Jesus is coming back very angry at most of the population of planet Earth and very happy at a tiny, tiny fraction of the population of planet Earth because... They're, they're the firstborn, they're the first fruits, right, into God's family. Jesus appears the day of trumpets, and then comes the last, the seven last plagues, the bowls of wrath, in Revelation 16, 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the river Euphrates, and the water was dried up. They gathered them together in the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The seventh angel, seventh angel poured out his bowl, into the air and a loud voice came just saying, it is done. <laughs> I used to read that and go, well, couldn't we have a little more description? It is done, <laughs> it doesn't say much, right? What's that? But when you tie the Battle of Armageddon, it's like on the, on the last couple of seconds of the Battle of Armageddon, when all of the enemy troops of Christ are dead, it is done. It's over. The wrath of God is finished. God's back at peace with what's remaining of humanity. And he's got a thousand years, he's going to start working to bring about an awesome, you know, humanity and history for man for a thousand years that, that you know, I, I don't know anybody could write what it would look like a thousand years, like, and, and nobody would read it. It's like, this is way too fanciful, this, this can't happen, these are not humans, these are, you know, machines or something. <laughs> Zechariah 14, 18, the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in. There will be no rain. See, they're going to have to pray for rain, and they, they won't be getting any because <laughs> they're not coming to the Feast of Tabernacles. 
right? Trumpets is the first of the seventh month, then atonement is the tenth day of the seventh month. So you get eight days between them, and then comes tabernacles on the fifteenth day of the month. So why did atonement get slotted in between the return of Christ and tabernacles, right? Because to me, and what we've seen, atonement is a great time to blow the trumpet of the Jubilee. Does anybody know when the Jubilee is? It's like, I think, I think we've lost track. The Israelites weren't doing it. And, and so it's like, in fact, I don't, do they even talk about it? Oh, yeah. And there's people that think they know when the Jubilee is, uh -huh. but they... But of course, it's been lost, so we can't know. Yeah, yeah. God didn't want us to know when he's yeah. coming, so of course. So I'll be, really be extremely surprised <laughs> if when atonement comes and the battle of Armageddon is over, that's not the jubilee, and Jesus has the trumpet blown and announces, you know, freedom. The world is free from the beast, it's free from Satan, the devil, it's free from pollution, it's free from, you know, and it's, and it's a whole new world being rebuilt. So... Um, the wrath of God will have ended and peace and freedom for mankind will reign for a thousand years. Armageddon is God's way of draining the human swamp and setting the captives free. And, and you know, anybody who, any human, right, because we're all planning to not be human anymore after the first day of the seventh month trumpets, right? Um, I can't even think of that. That would be awful. You wouldn't want to be left behind, would you? Anyhow. <clears throat> right, but but those humans who do live through the tribulation and through the battle of Armageddon, right, or, or still alive on planet Earth, they are going to have seen their world just blown apart, horror, horror after horror. You know, after Armageddon, Jesus begins setting all peoples free, and he begins making the streets of every city. He talks about Jerusalem, but Jerusalem's going to be the focal point, it's going to be the model city for all cities, right? And when I say cities, you probably think of cities, <laughs> but, but I think God's new world cities will be much, much different from what, you know, what we've got and what we're doing. Before Armageddon, each human can be set free by following the words of Christ, John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus told us that learning and knowing the truth is the way to make ourselves free. And most people don't want to take the time to learn the truth. They want a little snippet of, make me feel good, you know, give your heart to Jesus, I want to go to heaven when I die, that's all I need, oh, okay, I'll go to church on Sunday, and maybe on Wednesday too, right? Living in a physical freedom is great, right? Um, and <laughs> I try to call my brother every month, and almost every time, I, I, don't, I don't fish for it, but almost every time I, I get the sense of the Australian government, you know, allows them to do this, but not that, and this, and not that. And in fact, I think years ago they told me you, you couldn't cut a tree down on your property to check with the local city council. It's like, you know, okay. <laughs> and lots of other rules, but anyhow. Um, so physical freedom is still fantastic, <laughs> it, right? And, and you can see why a lot of people went to war willing to die to keep the freedom at home for their friends and relatives and their children and their family members and so on. So spiritual freedom is like unbelievably fantastic, you know, for each of us when we get a spirit being body. But it's, it's God's program. It's God's thinking. It's what God wants for mankind. And yes, there's a, there's a small number of rules. We've got Ten Commandments, right? But when you drive down the highway, most of us don't even think about it. We're free to do a huge number of things. There's a couple of things we're not really free to do. Although some, every now and then somebody does it. Like we've got a four-way stop near my house where almost nobody, there's almost never any traffic. <laughs> and so, so when I go near that four-way stop, it's like, there is no way. I, I'm going to stop early and watch. And, I, and not too long ago, somebody coming at crossways to me saw me, 
and just kept right on going. Just, I thought, how do you know I'm not like you and I'm going to break the law and go that way? <laughs> but I guess he said, I'll take my chances. <laughs> but but, uh, but so, so, you know, we're free in many, many ways as long as we abide by the law and order. Like, you know, you don't drive on the wrong side of the road, which I used to be tempted to do when I first got to America. <laughs> It just, it just felt right driving on. Anyhow, I, my wife, you know, she she got me straight, and I, I'd never do it anymore. I just I follow the other vehicles. <laughs> so Jesus told us that learning and knowing the truth is the way to make ourselves free, but we have to do the work. You know, he want, he's offering the freedom. Um, it's going to be so much greater the spiritual freedom and the people. You know, people living in a thousand years uh, are going to have unbelievable freedom. I think, I think things will be accomplished that we can't even imagine. Um, and, and, you know, children will, you know, they will be, the, all kids will be good, grow up to be good citizens. You know, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be fantastic? Um, anyhow, spiritual freedom gives us the power to work hand in hand with God the Father in building an ever-living spirit person. That's what, that's what each one of us is doing. We're, we're working with the Father. He's working with us. And, and <clears throat> the freedom is, um, you should never have a thought of, oh, I'm going to die and go to hell and be tortured. That, that should never cross your mind. It's totally untrue. It's totally unbiblical. And it's made up by men. And it's, you know, to frighten people into keeping coming to church and so on. Jesus, the freedom maker, sent Paul to teach freedom living, Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, right, free from blindness, to turn them from darkness, free from darkness. You know, what kind of a world would this be if, if everybody you knew, all your neighbors and friends, were free from darkness? And, and the darkness is getting stronger and more powerful almost daily nowadays. Right? And from the power of Satan, and Satan's power is getting stronger and stronger in the last three and a half years, the world will be worshipping Satan. And, and I, don't, I don't know what that looks like. Right? I don't want to know either. Right? But, but it says they shall worship the dragon. They worship Satan. And they worship the beast. And the whole thing will be a worship system. And if you cross the line, they'll kill you. So what you know, not a lot of freedom in that. Isn't that a great worship system? You know, here's, you got you got one choice, <laughs> and the other one isn't a choice. You're gone. You're out of here, right? Um, and an inheritance, right? And a freedom. What kind of freedom are you going to have once you are inherit the things that God belong to God? What belongs to God? Everything. Everything. You're going to inherit it, right? You're going to be right. And I was sanctified by faith in me. It just comes down to, if Jesus said it, it's true. If Jesus isn't saying it, then, you know, it probably isn't true. Or, you know, don't lean heavily on it, because you can only really have faith in what he teaches. In the next life, servants of Jesus will be freedom teachers. That's going to be our, one of our jobs. Teach people how to be free. Now, you know, it's going to be an interesting balance. Because if you show up behind some people who are about to do some illegal activity, right, they won't see you coming. You're just a, there you'll be, right? And then you'll, you'll say, in what kind of a voice will you choose, right? I mean, if, if you bark orders at them, you know, they might wet their pants, right? So that's not exactly the way you want to go, right? But if, you know, if you just suddenly tap them on the shoulder or something, you know, so, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> Where'd you come from? Where'd you, where'd, oh, you're those spirit police we heard about. <laughs> yeah, this I'd go in this direction if I were you. I wouldn't go in that direction. What are you going to do about it? Well, I've got several things I could do. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but you know, it's, in one sense, it would be spooky, right? It's, it's like, now, at least you can see a cop car coming, <laughs> right? in, in some cases. Right, especially with the lights on, it's like, ooh, is he pulling me over? You know, um, but so we'll be freedom teachers, but live righteous. You're free to live righteous. You're not free to live unrighteous. Daniel was given a view of how we will be serving God on the other side. 
Daniel 12.3, um, <clears throat> those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, that's the sun, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So how will you feel when you are brightly shining like the sun and the stars? It's like, in fact, that might be, you know, some, some smart Alex says, well, are you going to make me? I said, well, I could shine on you if you like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's too hot, it's too hot, turn it off, turn it off. Right, so it's, it's best to be focused daily on our God-given destiny when this life, life ends, you know. And you know, I keep counting off the years and my birthdays and it's looking, you know, less pleasant all the time. But uh, this life is going to end and we all know life ends. Right? And, and um, my, my friend Roger, he was so full of life when we were water skiing. But he's in a better place. So God has started our lights to be shining now. Right? We, we're not all that impressed with it and we wish people would pay attention. But 2 Corinthians 4 6. For it is, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And those, those hymns we were singing, you know, beautifully constructed out of Scripture and, and give glory to God. And, and his plan, you know, people not going to heaven to sit at the feet of Jesus and play harp music and stare up at his face, they're going to be freedom teachers. And we're, we're practicing learning freedom, right? God's way, righteous freedom. And, and we can also tell people, you know, yeah, I slipped and fell. You know, I fell short. I repented. I was an overcomer. You can be too. Um, you can do this. Every human being can do this and live for all eternity. Paul explains our spiritual freedom this way in Romans 6.18. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness or servants of righteousness. John and Paul help us understand the meaning of free from sin because it's a terrible translation, right? Because if you, you say that to anybody, they, they, they come up with their own conclusions which are all different. It's like, uh, oh, you know, I'm free from sin. Oh, you know, really? What did you do yesterday? <laughs> right? So, so it, it needs better understanding, right? But free from sin, and as shown to us by 1 John 3.10 and Galatians 5.21, in 1 John 3.10 he says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Well, that's a nice simple, that's really short and simple. If you don't practice righteousness, you're not of God. Now we've got to figure out what is practicing righteousness, right? And you read the book and you do what the book says and you don't do what, you know, the, the negative is. Galatians 5.21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and those who practice such things, he's telling the church members in Galatia, if you do these things, if you practice these things, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Your church members, you've all been told about getting eternal life, spirit being bodies, but you're not getting it if you practice the wrong stuff. 1 John 3, 4, whoever commits or practices, practices sin and, and <clears throat> um, commit, you know, if you commit something, you commit a traffic violation. You only, t you only do it once, right? You only have to do it once and you've committed a traffic violation. Right? But that term there is better understood practicing. If you're practicing sin, right, um, then you're committing, you're practicing lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And uh, <laughs> Paul spends much time on becoming free from sinful practices. Romans 6 17, he said, But God be thanked that when you were servants of sin, you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Most people are servants of sin. And, and you know, we don't, want to, we don't want to go around pointing fingers at people. You're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, right? Because um, that's a very negative approach. But they live in darkness. They don't understand, you know, what God is actually asking people. They, 
they got a snippet or two from the Bible, right? Um, love Jesus, give your heart to Jesus. In fact, that's not even in the Bible, is it? Give your heart to Jesus. But, but, but love Jesus. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus, right? Okay, if you're going to love me, keep my commandments. Oh, well, I don't go that far. <laughs> Okay, problem, right? But <clears throat> thanks be to God, when you were servants of sin, right, living in darkness, but you obeyed from the heart the doctrine that was delivered to you, right? So um, free from practicing sin, you became the servants of righteousness, which, you know, we are, but we don't feel like, it's like, we don't feel like we're a servant. We're, we're just a slave. We're... It's like we're just doing the right thing because the right thing is the best thing, right? And and we don't want to upset God. We love God. We don't want to, you know, be doing the wrong stuff. So Romans 6.19, just as you presented yourselves as slaves or servants of uncleanness and lawless needing to more lawlessness, right? And and that's, that's I think that's what happened in the, from Adam to the flood, uh, Methuselah lived 969 years. And I don't know what he did for his last birthday, but <laughs> he had a lot of birthdays. Goodness, right? But but lawlessness leads to more lawlessness, and we can see that in in the country and in, in Washington D.C. Lawlessness is leading to more lawlessness, right? And uh, down in down in Mexico, who's running the country in Mexico? Anybody know who's running the country? The cartels are running, and and the government is acting like, well, we control a little bit of it, <laughs> whatever, right? Romans six twenty, but when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness, right? Free from living God's ways, and most most people don't know God's ways, and what's more, most people don't want to know God's ways. They're satisfied with a little sliver that says, "I'm going to heaven when I die." Verse twenty two. But being made free from sin, practicing sin, you become the servants of God. You have the fruit unto holiness. And the end of the fruit unto holiness is everlasting life. And <clears throat> it's, it's like um, the immortality of the soul is, is if, if people have learned that as a young person, and then it's floating around the back of their brain for the rest of their life, they, they are in darkness because when you say live forever, the immortality of the soul says everybody lives forever. So that, that isn't such a big thing, right? But you will live in hell and be tortured forever. And it's like, it's like well, how does a person get tortured forever? Right? It's like, it's, well, God is love. See? Oh, well, that explains it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's nonsensical, but they don't they don't try and prove it one way or the other. They don't try to really discover the truth, and they don't really want to get to know God so much that they love Him beyond anything and everything. David, um, David in the in, in the Psalms, he loved what God wrote. He loved what God was doing. He loved how God helped him solve problems. You know, he had this this powerful love affair with God Almighty. And he's going to be ruler over the ten tribes of Israel. And Israel's going to be ruler over the other nations. So he'll be like vice president of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, he made mistakes, but he overcame. He came back. So Romans 6.23, the wages of... I, I, used to, I used to read that the wages of sin is death. It's like, oh, you get wages? You get paid for sin? <laughs> it's like, oh, you get paid in death. Well, all right. But, but wages, penalty, the penalty of sin, right? Unforgiven sin. And, and, you know, it would have been helpful to have that in the text too, or at least have it explained. Because if you get your sins forgiven, then you're not facing the second death. But if you don't get your sins forgiven, then you're headed for the second death and be gone forever. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all humans will end in one of two places. And... Um, that's, that's one of the things we're going to be teaching for 1,100 years. And, you know, hopefully, when, with no Satan around for the 1,000 years, we'll, we'll be able to talk to people. <laughs> Don't put your hand on the stove. It's hot. You'll burn your hand. Oh, okay. 
you know, and, and without Satan and, and all that, you know, thinking from Satan, um, I believe you're going to have very fine citizens at the end of a thousand years who love their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-great-grandchildren, and, and, you know, um, and then Satan will be turned loose for a hundred years, and, you know, apparently he still sways people after that. So all humans, let's see. The best, you know, you don't want to end in the second place, the second death. You want, you want to end in the first place, eternal life, spirit, being, body. So, um, okay, God is, God is best defined as love, and it's like, um, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means everything you can possibly dream of and far, far more than you can dream of. And it's, it's God's one word of, if you know what love is, I'm love on steroids, right? And that's how I operate, and that's what I'm thinking, and that's where we're going. And, and, the, and the, So therefore, there's no way God could allow for a system where you get tortured forever and ever and ever, and you can never die, and you never have any rest, you never have any peace, and, and, and you, you know, what kind of sins did you, did you rack up? Right? You, at least in this country, you, you, you break the law, you go to prison for so many years, and then they say, okay, you're good, you're clear, you're free, go. Right? So, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected or completed in us. We've, so the more we love God, and... and <clears throat> You know, saying love God doesn't mean much of anything, but loving what he teaches, right? Loving his Sabbath, loving his holy days throughout the year, loving his Ten Commandments. So freedom is an expression of love, and love does not enslave other people, which most humans like to have power over those around them, <laughs> right? And, and if they could, they would enslave them, 1 John 4:16 that we have, we have known and believed that the love of God has for us. God is love, repeated a second time, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So, you know, the more loving you are in this life, the more God is working through you, helping you to love more. If your windows are open, you might want to close your window. Um, anybody pray for rain? <laughs> I hope, hope you prayed for gentlemen. God is offering all humans the greatest freedom imaginable. Right? And, and, and what do most people think? Most people think that the God of the Bible is out to get them, wants to restrict them having fun, restrict them having freedom, restrict them doing the things they want to do, right? And, and the opposite is true. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also, so also is the first resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption. And, you know, I've been noticing my body is corrupting. It's, <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Verse 44. It's shown a natural body, the flesh, but it's raised a spiritual body. And, and God has only just given us a little teeny tiny vision of what it's like not to be flesh, but but to be ever living, ever living being in a different body, right, in the spiritual body. So, First um, Corinthians fifteen fifty three: This corruptible must put on incorruption; this mortal must put on immortality. And and you know, isn't that another way of saying freedom? Right? If you're a son or daughter of God Almighty. God is free, isn't he? Is there anything God isn't allowed to do? <laughs> There's no police telling God, pull over. <laughs> right? So God's got a lot of freedom, and if you're a child of God, you're going to have a lot of freedom, and he wants people to be free to do the right thing. Right? That's really all he's asking. 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love, right? And, and people who try to read the Bible shouldn't read it from a point of, I'm afraid of God. We have awe and respect for God, but not terror or fear. Unless, of course, you want to live lawlessly, and then the, the last, the balls of the last plagues of God's wrath will come be pouring out on them. So, perfect love casts out fear, which which is another way of saying freedom, right? What what do we have?
to fear 50 years from now, right? Technically nothing, but, you know, 50 years from now, Christ will be on the planet ruling the earth. And, and you know, um, what can man do to us, you know, other than take our lives for us, which, which just bumps us over into the next life, right? We have to wait until the first resurrection, but so he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And the more you love God, the more free you are, the more freedom you have. And that's why, you know, God is a God of freedom. God wants the children free. He wants everybody free. And, and <clears throat> it's, it's, people can't see freedom in the Sabbath. It's like, it's, a, it's like, you want me to give a whole 24 hours a, a, a week, every week, and I can't do any work? I'll just starve to death, you know. So, God wants all humans living in safety and free from danger from other people. And what have we got? We've got Putin in Ukraine. We've got China getting ready to take Taiwan. We've got uh, the North Korean guy ready to take South Korea. We've got the Iranians ready to take Israel. Um, you know, the, the world is getting darker and darker on the, on the world scene. But God has a plan and that will come to be. So, <clears throat> Jeremiah 32, 37, Behold, I will gather them out of the countries where I have driven, I have driven them, right? God, God admits, I sent you all into captivity, right? Where I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and my great wrath. You don't, you don't want to get mixed up with God's fury and anger and wrath. And I will bring them back after the battle of Armageddon. I will cause them to dwell safely. And, and uh, <clears throat> I... Uh, the more the more I learn about history, American history, and the world history, the more I love it, and and the more I'm hoping that God will allow me to have a history museum. If I get one city, I hope He'll let me have a, a history museum, and I can point take people on a tour and say, "This is what Hitler did." Ugh, Hitler, nasty person. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be like Hitler, right? So verse 38: and They shall be my people, and I will be their God. God does not want people to live in fear of God. It's like, you know, call me father, right? But some people had a father that they were in fear of. So it's, 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 he's said it so many different ways. You know, call me father. Jesus wants to marry those who are servants of his. Um, the, the future is just unbelievably awesomely free and wonderful if, if you can just get away from God hates people God doesn't hate people he loves people God does not want people to live in fear of God unless they're living lawless lives 1 John 5 2 by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments oops there's those nasty words again right for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome right and all my time in churches of God I never heard people say Oh, the Sabbath is such a burden, <laughs> right? When it's, it's a free day. It's free from doing all the stuff you really should be doing, right? <laughs> American freedom was built on the idea of law and order, which we're losing a lot of these days. From the top person down to the lowest person, everybody, you know, is, is supposed to be treated, and that's one of the reasons that patriotism can be what it is. It's like everybody gets a fair shot. You know, you, do the, you put the energy, the work in, and you get the, the benefit of the blessing from it. God built America with freedom at its core, and God is taking humanity to freedom and safety for 1,000 years. 